Like the American Civil War, the uh, First World War was a very traumatic event, what war is not, of course. But it was traumatic in terms of, not necessarily in, in terms of the destruction, obviously it was a war that was fought on foreign soil. Uh, for the Americans, it was a very brief war. I mean, it started in 1917, ended in 1918. And while you know, there was a tragic loss of life, um, certainly the devastation wasn't as great as, say, uh, the Civil War. But it did, in some measure, change the perspective of many writers. We think of some of the great 20th century writers. We think of people like F. Scott Fitzgerald and um, uh, you know, uh, Ernest Hemingway and people of this nature. Individuals who were expatriates or for whom World War I was a very disruptive sort of influence in terms of their life, but also a very influential influence in terms of their careers. Well, we're going to be t taking a look at a number of poets here between the wars. We're not going to be looking at necessarily war poetry. We're going to be looking at poets that were very prominent, that um, many of whom uh, were reaching their peak between the wars. Um, and also, we're going to be looking at, um, in particular, uh, poets uh, who are part of a movement known as the Imagist movement, okay, or Imagism. Uh, but first, we're going to start with Robert Frost. Robert Frost is probably. Oh, gosh, what do you do? Um, everybody says they love Robert Frost. Every high school English teacher says she loves or he loves Robert Frost. And every high school student loves Robert Frost. And you know why they love Robert Frost? Because they think they understand him. Uh, you read some of these other poems. You read The Emperor of Ice Cream. You read some of the more uh, difficult and... Um, you know, uh, complex poems. And then you read Frost and you think, oh, that's so easy. It's in plain English. It's about walls and about trees and about snowy woods. And I can understand this. The difficulty with that is that a lot of people, I think, overlook the complexity and depth of Frost. And they also think of him because of this persona that he cultivates for himself. Remember we talked about Whitman cultivating a persona for himself. Frost was very carefully cultivated a persona of this you know, rustic, simple New England farmer, which is a, a crock of bull, okay? Um, yes, he was from New England. Yes, he bought himself a farm, but this was a lot of showmanship and not a lot of substance. In fact, uh, we also have this uh, sort of view of him as being sort of pastoral and, and contemplative and easygoing. He was an incredibly difficult man. Um, and by some accounts, and I'm not just trusting his son's account because that was pretty scathing, even the students that he had just said, the guy was just a general horse's ass. Um, you take it for what it's worth. I've read a lot of biographies on Frost. Some I believe, some I don't believe. But all I can say is look with a bit of a skeptical eye as to what you think you know about Robert Frost, and particularly about his poetry. I want to look at Mending Wall. You've read the poem. It's a fairly straightforward poem. I'm not going to dissect these because it takes too long. You could do an explication of each of these on your own that would take, oh, well over an hour. These are just meant to be short commentaries. And what I want to pick out of a few of these, like Mending Wall, are some of the things that most people kind of gloss on over and don't look at. When I read Robert Frost, and I loved my high school American literature teacher. She's a wonderful person. I still keep in touch with her. However, um, I don't think I got the, the, the real Robert Frost when we read Robert Frost in her class. Um, Frost's mending wall... I was told, was about people, you know, good fences make good neighbors, and we ought to respect each other's boundaries. And, you know, it's all about individual rights and being good and neighborly and wally. Uh, no, it's about something deeper than that, my friend. Uh, and you can take a look at it if you wish. A um, couple of things. Um, 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 there where it does not, uh, where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get cr across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says good fences make good neighbors. Um, it, you know, the, 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 the poet is saying, why are we, why, you know, why do we have these walls? These walls seem silly. These walls seem stupid. The neighbor is like, good, good fences make good neighbors, right? Um, it's almost a cliche for him. He doesn't think. The poet thinks. The poet thinks further than the neighbor does. The poet's like, well, I mean, you know, I mean, I got apples on this side of the wall and you got pine trees on the other side. It's not like the apples are going to go over and, you know, kind of 
you know, eat the pine trees, right? I mean, this is kind of silly. Why do we have this stupid wall? It's a lot of work for nothing. And the neighbor is used to sort of conventional thinking, conventional wisdom, cliched thought. He just does, he's a creature of habit and a creature of tradition, and the, and, and the, narrow, and the, uh, the poet is not. The poet thinks deeply. The poet is basically a big troublemaker in some respects. He's always asking the questions, you know, why, 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 why do we do it this way? Why do we have this? Why, why is this law here? Why is this rule here? Why don't we do something different, do something new? He's a bit of a radical in a way because he doesn't really want to do, and, and, and there's a sense that I don't really want to do this. Um, uh, it, it, it also is, is about, if you look at it carefully, it's about two people who may be close to each other in proximity, but philosophically and in terms of the way that they approach things things uh, intellectually and maybe even spiritually, if you want to read into it that far, um, are, are nowhere near as close as they are physically, right? I mean, these two guys are of a very different temperament. And I think in some ways, you know, I think it raises the question, as I said in the notes about Emerson saying, we never really touch in this world. You think you know someone, you think you are, you know, somehow related to them or have some sort of special bond with them, but you'll never really know them entirely because you're not them. You can't get inside of them in their head. Um, the, the great metaphor that Emerson uses is two balls, or like think, think of like two tennis balls, right? And you try to get the two tennis balls to touch. They can only touch at one spot, right? They can never fully touch. Uh, you can roll them around and touch them you know, in different parts of the, the ball, but, but there's only that one point of contact there. And he said, that's kind of the way souls are. They do touch, but it's not as though one soul can really know or be up against or experience another human soul. Um, not fully, anyway. So I think that's one of the things he's trying to get around to here. I invite you to kind of read the poem and see if you don't see some of the similar things. This is a deeper poem, as is Birch's, in my view. Uh, it has a lot to do with youth and aging and identity and death and all those kinds of things. But take a look, if you will, towards the, towards the uh, well, in the second stanza. Where he says, "So was I once a swinger of birches, and so I now." So don't don't think of swinging of birches or birch swinging or what have you as just this activity that maybe little boys do or used to do or whatever. Um, it, it, think of it as kind of metaphorical for something. Okay, um, what does he mean when he says, "I'm a swinger of birches," or "I once was a swinger of birches," or what does it mean to swing on birches? Well, think about it. I mean, you're going up and down and up and down, right? It's a rather, it's a rather dangerous kind of thing to do, right? Um, and so, I mean, so hidden sort of in the background is, you know, I could see my mother running out going, boys, don't do that. You know, someone's going to break their necks, right? Um, it's a dangerous activity, and so it is kind of playing with death in a way. It's, it's, it's sort of the thrill involved. It's, it's going beyond or trying to escape gravity in some ways. It's trying to escape reality and the laws of reality and the laws of nature and, and such. I mean, human beings weren't made to swing on birches, okay? Um, and uh, so he says, so once was I a, myself a swinger of birches, and so I dream of going back to be, right? A return to youth? A return to a more risk-taking time in his life? Maybe. I, you, you decide for yourself what you think. It's when I'm weary of considerations, and life is too much like a pathless wood where your face burns and tickles and the cobwebs broken across it and one eye's weeping from a twig's having lashed across, across it open. I'd like to get away from Earth for a while, and then come back Back to it and begin over, right? This has something to do with mortality, the limitations of life, the burdens of life, the burdens of adulthood, probably, no question about that in my mind, uh, and then come back to it and begin over. May no fate willfully misunderstand me and half grant what I wish and snatch me away not to return. Hey, 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 universe, God, don't misunderstand me. I'm not asking to die here, okay? Uh, right? It's not like I want to die and come back, okay? I kind of want to stay here, but I kind of would like to escape you know, the, 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 the realities of life for a while and, you know, be carefree and more risk-taking. Okay. Uh, in that sense, the poem is really kind of romantic, isn't it? In a way. Um, Earth's the right place for love, and I don't know where I'd, uh, it's likely to go better. I'd like to go by climbing a birch tree and climb black branches up a snow-white trunk toward heaven till the tree could bear no more but dipped its top and set me down again. That would be a good way both going and coming back. One could do worse than be a swinger of birches. There I think he's saying how I'd like to die. Most of you are familiar with his poem, uh, Stopping by Woods on a snowy evening. That 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 poem is very much about contemplating the possibility of suicide. Um, he doesn't 
go into the day. The woods are deep and dark and so on, and he doesn't go in. He stops by, meaning he contemplates, should I end my life? But he doesn't because he says, I have miles to go before I sleep, um, meaning I've got much more life to live. Uh, it's tempting. He says the woods are dark and deep. It's tempting um, to end your life because of the cares and the and the hardship and the pain and the suffering and the and 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 the emotional trauma that you run into in life. But he doesn't want to. Uh, and here he talks about death, but he doesn't want to. Um, and so, so a couple of things to we'll look at the other two frost poems, and then uh, hopefully you guys will have some interesting things to add in the discussion uh, as well.